Our text for this morning is Revelation chapter 20, verses 1 through 3. I am going to read through verse 10. As it contains the majority, I would say, of this pericope. So let us pay heed to this inerrant, infallible, holy word of our God from Revelation chapter 20, verses 1 through 3. Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, holding in his hand the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain. And he seized the dragon, that ancient serpent who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years and threw him into the pit and shut it and sealed it over him so that he might not deceive the nations any longer until the thousand years were ended. After that, he must be released for a little while. Then I saw thrones, and seated on them were those to whom the authority to judge was committed. Also I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for the testimony of Jesus and for the word of God, and who had not worshipped the beast or its image, and had not received its mark on their foreheads or their hands. They came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. The rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were ended. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is the one who shares in the first resurrection. Over such, the second has no, the second death has no power, but they will be priests of God and of Christ, and they will reign with him for a thousand years. And when the thousand years are ended, Satan will be released from his prison and will come out to deceive the nations that are at the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them for battle. Their number is like the sand of the sea, and they marched up over the broad plain of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints and the beloved city. But fire came down from heaven and consumed them, and the devil who had deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and sulfur where the beast and the false prophet were. And they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Amen. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we do again come before you, praising you for your majesty, for your holiness, for your transcendence, and for your eminence coming to make the way for your people. Help us to see something of that this morning. Help us to get a clearer understanding of the work that you are about for your people, for this creation, for your glory. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So, we have arrived. When many think about the book of Revelation, the first thing that comes to mind, besides a series of books by Tim LaHaye is tribulation or the millennium or the rapture. And here we see these words a thousand years. For the last 19 chapters, some of you have patiently waited. Some of you possibly wanting me to speak to you regarding the rapture or the millennium or the thousand years. And the first thing I would have you notice is you haven't read these words a thousand years until we came to Revelation chapter 20. I would also have you take note that you haven't seen the word rapture in the last 19 chapters, nor will you see it in the last chapters as well. You have read of tribulation. You have read of many visions given to John describing a time of struggle and of suffering. A time where God's people are to overcome as the seven churches were exhorted, called to overcome. And we had yet to read of a millennium or of a period of a thousand years. But now finally we are here. Our passage again is only the first three verses of Revelation 20. But you will notice that in the first ten verses... We read of this period of a thousand years six times. And you need to know that these verses are the only place in Scripture, although it is much discussed, they're the only place in Scripture where you read of this thousand year period in Scripture. And it's highly and often thought of a thousand years in the future somewhere. 
And so this thousand years must be a part and a significant part of what we are going to discuss this morning. And for the next few weeks, we will still continue to discuss this as we have broken this down into three separate messages in the first 10 verses. But we're going to see Satan bound, the reign of saints with Christ uh, uh, in a battle, a battle when, and this is significant, when this thousand years are ended. But again, this morning, we are going to be discussing the binding of Satan for a thousand years. And what we learn really from these first three verses for us, for them at the time, is that Satan has been bound. Satan has already been bound until Christ's second advent. And so for us, this means that we are to be about the business of advancing his kingdom without fear in full confidence. Why? Because Satan has been bound. We're going to look at this in two basic parts. I don't believe the text is that difficult to discuss, but it can get that way. Uh, but we're, go we're going to discuss first this thousand years and where it fits into this revelation of Jesus Christ and into our timeline, if you will. And then se second, we will discuss what it means that Satan is bound. What does it mean that Satan is bound? I don't want this to become academic, but we have to at least briefly discuss uh, some of the views of this thousand years again this is a bit different than how i might ordin ordinarily come to the scripture but the most important piece here is what and when is this thousand years and so historically there have been only two it might surprise you for me to say this at the beginning there have only been two main views uh, on the revelation of Jesus Christ to the second coming of Christ in regards to this thousand year period. Jesus either comes uh, pre-millennially before the thousand years or post-millennially after the thousand years. That's the basic distinction. Of course, that's then further broken down uh, by premillennialists into historic premillennialism, which was and has been an accepted understanding of the end, uh, of the end times that's been around since the church age, as we call it, began. And then there is the dispensational premillennialist, which is what most people have been subjected to in our lifetimes and has only been around since the early 1800s and took off when C.I. Schofield put his dispensational notes into his study Bible in the early 1900s, I believe 1909 or something like that. Now, most of you know that if you've been around very long, that once you get into dispensational premillennialism and probably even in, into historic, you can then further break it down into pre, mid, or post-tribulation pre-millennialism, and so on and so on if you get into a discussion with someone about their eschatological views. And so no matter what I say or what I would say regarding pre-millennialism, someone is going to say that I am misrepresenting pre-millennialism, at least according to them. Um, so let me simply say this, and I, and I kind of garnered this mostly from Joel Beakey's comments so that you can blame Joel Beakey instead of myself. Uh, Premillennialists at a basic level teach that Christ is going to come again. And when he comes again, he will bind Satan and then he will establish his kingdom and reign for a thousand years. This will be a thousand year period of peace where Satan has absolutely zero activity upon the earth. And then Satan will be loosed once more for a little while, which I would then question how long their little while is since they believe that things that must soon take place, uh, as we read in Revelation 1.1, is now at 2,000 years and counting. But he'll be released for a little while. And much, and much of what I've just stated is also based on the fact that premillennialists hold 
uh, that Revelation chapter 17 through 19 is chronological, that all of Revelation really is chronological. They believe that Babylon is judged uh, and destroyed in chapter 17 and 18, that the beast and the false prophet are destroyed in chapter 19, and then this thousand years of Satan's binding will happen. Peace on earth begins in chapter 20. Add to this that the thousand years must be a literal thousand years. And again, premillennialists see the return of Christ and then a great battle of Armageddon in chapter 19 and then a thousand year reign in in chapter 20 verses 1 through 3 and then another battle after the thousand years with Satan joining together with a group of people that weren't converted. And again, this is part that I don't understand, trying to be gracious here, but they weren't converted during this thousand year period of peace with Christ reigning. And then the new heaven and the new earth get established. We'll talk about that a little bit more as we continue through this chapter, but I can say that it simply does not seem to add up for me, if you will. On the other hand, we have the only other option which is post-millennial, which is what you could call yourself, but you shouldn't. (laughs) Those that believe that Jesus will return after the millennium or after this thousand year period, which I do, which is what is taught in our standards. Um, And these, these though, or the post-millennialists are then further divided into what we might call those that are Uh, maybe more properly post-millennial and those like myself that are uh, ah-millennial. Both post- and uh, ah-millennialists believe that Jesus comes after the millennium. The difference is mostly on the historic belief of a post-millennialist that there is going to be a golden age of Christianity. Many today that call themselves post-millennialists nuance this golden age or say that they don't hold to a golden age at all or at least is how it has been historically established they say as i would say that the millennium is now but again historically post-millennialists have held that the millennium is still out there in the future the same as a premillennialist because there has there has to come this quote unquote better christian world of sorts established before Christ returns. And this has been the distinguishing feature that our millennial uh, folk as myself reject. We don't believe that there is a period in the future that is going to be better, but simply we have been in the millennium since the coming of Christ. Historically, again, post mills have believed that there is going to be what uh, Dennis Johnson calls an almost curse-free and almost suffering-free era on earth before the coming of the consummation of the new heavens and the new earth. I might say it this way, post-millennialism sees an advance in the kingdom in an earthly manner on the earth that amillennialism does not. We see an advancement spiritually, but not by necessity earthly. I myself read in Scripture that suffering is a part of the believer's life. You heard that this morning, as a matter of fact, from Sinclair Ferguson. Um, The slave is not greater than the master. I read that Christ's kingdom is not of this world. If it was, we would fight. Even while I understand, again, and this is a post-millennial or amillennial position, that Christ is even now sitting upon his throne and reigning. But the point of the text before us, Revelation 20 verses 1 through 3, is not so much to distinguish the difference or that we need to distinguish the difference between post and ah millennialism. So I'll leave that there for now. What post and ah millennialists agree on is that the, the millennium occurs before the coming of Christ. And that, I believe, is what we have seen throughout the revelation of Jesus Christ here this being this book being the revelation of Jesus Christ and so I want us to take a look at the overarching understanding that we have gone through that some of you might have wished I had done before but I think now is the time 
And if you're a person that takes notes, this might be one for your notepad. If it's not, it still might be a time to take a note. Write this down quickly. I'll say it again, but write down, and you can go top to bottom if it helps, and then you can add your notes in. Three, four, four, three, two, three, three. Three, four, four, three, two, three, three. This is the shorthand or the Cliff's Notes version for those of us who know what Cliff's Notes are um, of Revelation. The first three chapters of Revelation is that first three. They were the prologue and the letters to the churches uh, saying in those first three chapters, this is what is going, this, is, this revelation is soon to come to pass and for the church to prepare and be ready to overcome what is soon to come to pass. The next four chapters, verses or chapters four through seven, four, five, six, seven, are the vision in the throne room and the seven seals. And again, this is shorthand. Don't call me to the carpet later because I know this, but this is, I'm making this easy for you. The seven seals goes into chapter eight a little bit, but just stick with me with the, for the number. So four, um, the four chapters are the throne room and the seals. The next four chapters, chapters eight through 11, are the vision of the trumpets. The next three chapters, chapters 12, 13, 14, are what we call the symbolic history, the history of the child and the dragon, the mother, the beasts, and finally the harvest. The next two chapters, the only two that's in our list then, chapters 15 and 16, are the seven plagues or bowls. The next three chapters, chapters 17 through 19, then focus in on the final judgment of Babylon and the beasts and the return of Christ at the end of chapter 19 and the beast and the false prophet being thrown into the lake of fire there at the end of chapter 19, which is significant for what's coming in chapter 20. And now we are in this final three of our list, the last Three chapters of Revelation, chapters 20, 21, and 22. And we have seen, or what we have here is this angel coming, binding Satan for a thousand years, saints reigning with Christ for a thousand years in the next three verses, and then Satan will be released for a little while and then thrown into the lake of fire. And then just going forward, then we move even further into time, and to the new heavens and the new earth and the new Jerusalem and eternity with God for the people of God. If you understand that framework for revelation, as we come to what some would call this last cycle, what you see is we have a prologue to the revelation of Christ of what's soon to come. And then the letters and then each cycle or section after that is describing the inter-advental world, the inter-advental description from a different perspective of the world that we live in since the first coming of Christ until the second. Chapter 4, chapter 8, Chapter 12, again, that can be kind of easy to remember, right? 4, 8, 12, and then 15 throws it off. But now chapter 20, each of those begin with the first advent. Each of those chapters, each of those visions begin with what happened 2,000 years ago at the time of Christ and the apostles. And again, we're going to see some of that in the next few weeks. But just for now, I want you to consider with me a few verses to add into this mix, if you will. In Matthew chapter 25, verse 41, Jesus describes um, Satan ruling a host of fallen angels. Matthew 25, 41. And then in Luke chapter 4, verse 6, Satan tempts Jesus with authority 
the authority he says that he had been given, that Satan had been given, he will give to Jesus. But then in Luke chapter 11, Jesus says, and again, we're going to come back to this in a few moments. Jesus says that Satan is under attack in Luke 11 from the stronger man. And then just before that, in Luke chapter 10, Jesus had told his disciples they had gone to preach and they returned from the preaching and they were amazed that the demons were subject to them. And Jesus told them Satan had fallen to the earth. Think of Revelation chapter 12 in that context. In John chapter 12, the crowd, Jesus is speaking, and the crowd hears a voice from heaven. They said it thundered. And Jesus said, this was for you. For now is the judgment of this world. Now will the ruler of this world be cast out. Again, John chapter 12. And again, for you, think of Revelation chapter 12, verses 7 through 17, mostly. What am I pointing towards? In each of these cycles of visions uh, for John and for the people of God then and for us now, um, God is describing, again in these form of visions, what was happening and continues to happen in this world since the first coming of Christ. Revelation is not chronological. It's not meant to be a manual or a timeline. It's meant to show us in each of the visions that Christ has come, that something has been inaugurated that was not here before, that He defeated Satan as we were hearing in some of the verses that I just read. That he was there to attack and to, to, defeat, to defeat Satan. And he, he opened up, if you will, the gates of heaven, the kingdom of God in his first advent to those outside of the nation of Israel. And as part of that move of the kingdom of God into all of the world, uh, the temple in Jerusalem is destroyed in 70 AD, an exclamation point to its ending And it's the opening up of the gospel through the true temple of God, Christ himself and his people covering the earth. Now, before anyone is going to accept this, though, still, we have to accept that this thousand years can't be a literal thousand years. Because again, we've moved beyond 1,000 years since Christ's first advent. And what I am telling you is that we have been in the millennium this thousand years since the time of Christ. This must mean that a thousand years must be symbolic as numbers in Revelation have been. But this phrase for a thousand has been figurative or symbolic throughout Scripture. It's not just uh, here in Revelation. Some of you may have seen a list that I shared earlier, earlier this week on our church page. Uh, and there it was shared that 1,000 is used literally for money. 1,000 is used literally when they're counting people in certain points in Scripture. But with regard to time, it's always a symbol. I usually start with Psalm 50, verse 10 where God inspires Asaph to write in what we call Hebrew uh, parallelism. Again, this is Psalm 50, verse 10. Every beast of the forest is mine, the cattle on a thousand hills. And in that Hebrew parallelism, um, what Asaph is writing, inspired by God, is that cattle on a thousand hills compared to every beast of the forest means every beast, every cow in existence, all of them are mine. A thousand means every in this Hebrew poetry parallelism in this psalm. In Psalm, in psalm uh, 84, verse 10, 
We read, one day in God's courts is better than a thousand elsewhere. That means all the days elsewhere. One day in God's court is better than all the days outside of His courts. Psalm 105, verse 8, He remembers His covenant forever, the word that He commanded for a thousand generations. That doesn't mean that God stops remembering His covenant at the thousand and one generation. How do I know? Because Psalm 105, verse 10, two verses later, He calls this for a thousand generations covenant an everlasting covenant. A thousand generations means as many generations as will come until God consummates all things. There are other passages, not just a few, but many that show the symbolic use of 1,000 as a large number to project however many, however long it is. It is all God's, whatever it is. It belongs to Him, whatever the time, however long it takes, however many generations, all that time is determined by Him and His control because it's all His. And so as we look to the six times we will read a thousand years in chapter 20, and with respect this morning to Satan being bound for a thousand years, it means as long as God has determined it to be, when God's plan and purpose for Satan and this present fallen world are done in a thousand generations or in a thousand years, then Satan will be released. But now back to when he was bound. Let us go to verse 1. We're not just beginning. That wasn't just the intro. But we go back to verse 1 and we try to begin to tie these things together. We start with the words, Then I saw, which we now know signals a shift into a new vision. And it's not necessary, necessarily chronologically. I don't know how much we've talked about this before, but again, it's similar to if you were having a dream and you were trying to relate to your friends the next day, the dreams that you had, multiple, and you started with, I was sitting at the dinner table with some friends and then I saw something happening in the sky that led to some battle that I saw. And then I saw this creature with a key grabbing a dragon and someone asked you, well, were you at the table and the roof opened up and how did all this transition from one to the other? And you would say, I don't know. The dream, I just saw this and then I saw that. And I don't know exactly how it moved from one vision to the next, but it shifted. And it might have even seemed in the dreams that you were having that some of the things that I dreamed later should have or would have happened before the things that I dreamed earlier in my chronological pattern of dreaming. And it goes on and on like that as we think about the dreams that we have. And so here in this vision, an angel coming down from heaven, holding a key to the bottomless pit, which he can identify. Because again, how do we know that he's got the key to the bottomless pit? It's from what happens next. And he's also holding a great chain and this angel seizes the dragon that ancient serpent who is the devil and satan and binds him for a thousand years and throws him into the pit and shuts it and seals it over him now first let us recognize that here we have the symbols for satan collected if you want your verse to identify the serpent and the dragon and the devil and the satan and satan is the same Here's your verse, Revelation chapter 20, verse 2. If you also want a verse that suggests that Satan is only as powerful as God allows him to be, here is your verse. Because an angel simply comes down from heaven, we can safely assume that this angel comes down at God's command, and Satan yields to this seizing by another creature, assumably with the same amount of of power, if you will, within his nature, another angel, but he's coming at the command of God. Uh, Kistemacher writes, 
He calls this an arrest. Satan is arrested here for his rebellion and he is chained, bound, thrown, shut in and sealed into the bottomless, into this bottomless pit. And the question is, we have the scene, what does it mean? In Luke chapter 11, and I mentioned this before, Luke 11, Jesus is casting out a demon, and some of the people say that he's casting out a demon by Beelzebul, the prince of demons, basically by Satan, because Jesus responds by saying to them, if Satan is divided against himself, how is his kingdom going to stand? And Jesus finishes by saying in verses 21 and 22 of Luke 11, when a strong man, fully armed, guards his own palace, his goods are safe. But when one stronger than he attacks him and overcomes him, he takes away his armor in which he trusted and divides his spoils. And then Jesus says in Luke eleven twenty three, whoever is not with me is against me. And whoever does not gather with me scatters. Jesus is telling them, for those with ears to hear, Satan is the strong man. But Jesus is the one who is stronger than he. And Jesus has come. Then he stands before them, the stronger man. And Satan is under attack. The armor in which Satan trusted is being taken away. And his spoils, let me say now, the nations of the world, his spoils are no longer his. And they are being divvied up. The time of gathering from the spoils of Satan has arrived. And if you are not gathering with him, you are a scatterer. And this will go on for a thousand years before Christ before the Messiah came Israel was God's nation spiritually and literally geographically to be one of God's people meant you were going to be a Jew you were going to come into the nation of Israel if you were one of God's people Satan had deceived the nations of the world. He had been given authority to deceive the nations of the world. The people of the world had dispersed at the time of the Tower of Babel, but God had preserved a line that worked its way from Genesis 3.15 through Noah, Abraham, Moses, through the line of David, and Satan had, dest- had tried to destroy that line, and he had come close. To destroying that line. But God is faithful to his promise. And now the Messiah has come. The stronger man has come. And in the revelation of Jesus Christ. The book that we have been covering for over a year now. We read from various perspectives. From various views. Not how to avoid getting chips in our hands and our foreheads. Not how to be nervous about helicopters flying in the sky. We read of the end of the deception of Satan over the nations, over the Gentile world. Christ comes at the beginning of each of these visions and he's defeating Satan. And he's beginning the punishment upon the world that the world deserves. In Colossians 2, and I'm going to turn there, in Colossians 2, we read not very long ago. Colossians 2, verses 13 through 15. And you who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses, by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. 
He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. In 1 John chapter 3, verse 8, John, the same John writing the revelation that we're going through, in 1 John 3, 8, we read, the reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil, not in the future, then. Past tense, John the Apostle, the reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. Christ comes. He literally came in the first century A.D., which is why we call it A.D. And he lived the sinless life that we cannot live. And he forgave the sins of his people, Colossians 2. He canceled the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands by nailing it to the cross and declaring it is finished. It's finished. And the accuser was defeated on the cross. He, he was seized by an angel then. And he was bound and he was cast into the bottomless pit and Christ ascended and he sits upon his throne and he broke a seal and a trumpet blew and bowls of wrath began to be poured out and God's people were called then and for a thousand years, however long that is, to overcome through all the tribulation that we face in this age as God has begun already his punishment of sin even now. But then you'll ask me, is Satan really bound? I don't believe when I look around and think of the evil and wickedness that's in this world that he's really bound. But this is, this is where we forget that God's ways are not our ways and that we, all, we, we really have no idea what it was like before Jesus came. Even though we've just read about God's ways in the last 19 chapters, but people try to put all of this stuff into the future. All of these things into the future. And we said this before, but we look around and, and you see now war and famine and pestilence and earthquakes and death. And somehow we're kind of told not to make a connection now between God's judgment that it's still somehow just in the future. Sometimes I think of Psalm 139 where David says, no matter, and I'm not quoting the psalm, but this is what he says, no matter where you go, you cannot hide from God. You can go into heaven, you can go into Sheol, no matter where you go, you can't hide from God. And I jokingly make the comment whenever it happens or after it's happened, about survivors, again, don't take me the wrong way. If you don't want to have your property destroyed or you don't want to die in a hurricane, then don't live off the coast of Florida because it's going to happen, right? Move if you don't want to see those kinds of things happen to you. But the point here, the relation I'm making is no matter where you move, there are hurricanes, typhoons, floods, tornadoes, earthquakes, body destroying heat or cold there is nowhere you can go to escape the curse and to escape the judgment that is already upon this fallen world that it deserves and it's still even nothing compared to what's coming but guess what is not present since Christ's first advent it's what we find in verse Two or verse three. Satan's ability to deceive the nations. That's what's not here. That word for nations there is ethne too. It's, it's the word for nations or it's the word for Gentiles. When that angel comes and seizes the dragon 2,000 years ago, he's keeping him from deceiving the nations any longer that's what's happening in revelation 20 verses 1 through 3 not in the future but then 
At the time of Christ's first advent, Satan lost his power. The veil was rent. The curtain was torn. The old temple is useless. Every man can go to Christ directly as a mediator. And Satan cannot deceive the nations. The point of this pit, because people will say, well, it says uh, he's thrown into the pit. It's shut. It's sealed. It can't mean what you're talking about. But the point of the pit, no matter what words you use, it says is to keep him simply from deceiving the nations. That's what the point of the pit is. Um, again, one theologian says we could use the words. It's, it's equivalent to signed, sealed, and delivered, which the older folks who listen to Stevie Wonder would understand signed, sealed, delivered, maybe. But the arrest was made. The verdict was done. The sentence was carried out with Christ's victory on the cross. But we were, we're told to act like the victory's not done. Sometimes people make much of Satan going about like a roaring lion, lion seeing whom he may devour. And it's true. He is a formidable foe. But he cannot stop the advance of the gospel into any nation. Satan is one creature. Sometimes we treat Satan or we speak about Satan like he's godlike. Satan is one creature and he has to work as one creature on one individual at a time, if you will. But God, Psalm 2, has set his king on his holy hill. The nations are his heritage. The ends of the earth are his possession and Satan is defeated. There will be a time when Satan will be loosed for a short time. We'll save this for two weeks from now, Lord willing. But what does this mean for us? What does all of this mean for us? How does this affect our lives? Matthew 28. Matthew 28. It's the Great Commission. Heard like you haven't heard it before. Possibly. Hear the words from, from, from Matthew 28 again. Jesus, Jesus tells these women who run across him after his resurrection. Jesus says, Go tell my disciples, the apostles, to meet me in Galilee. Um, where we read in verse 16, Matthew 28, 16, he must have already told the disciples to meet him there before he was even crucified. Because it says they met him at the mountain in Galilee where he'd already told them. So before he was crucified, he said, when this is all over, meet me in Galilee on this mountain. And so they go and they meet him. And what does he tell them? What does he tell them in the Great Commission? He says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and do what? Think it through. Make disciples. Of all the nations. Why? Because Satan is bound. We don't understand this properly as we should. I think we all fall short of understanding the, the structure of the world that we live in since Christ came the first time because we've been taught improperly. All authority in heaven and on earth now resides with Christ at His resurrection. This means that all authority wasn't there before. Like Satan was offering him this authority that he'd been given in the temptation. There was something that was not under his authority in some sense, or else he would not have said it. But he truly has all authority now. As we've said before, he's the Savior because he's God, but He's also the Savior because He came and He earned it. And He lived the life that needed to be lived and He submitted that life to bring us salvation. And now, now Satan has no more authority to deceive the nations. S Satan can no longer keep 
Canaanites and Babylonians and Assyrians from receiving the light of the gospel. And we don't understand what that means completely. I said this earlier. Why do we not understand that? Because we've never lived in that world. We don't understand what it was like to live in a world where Satan had the authority to deceive the nations. But why have we never lived in that world? That's what we need to focus on. Because Christ came and he defeated Satan and he bound him from that very thing. That's the church age that we live in. Joel Beakey, again, gives this example for us. I'm going to modify it a little bit so you can give the bad parts to me. But Joel Beakey says, if you go to uh, a dear friend's house for a backyard picnic, you know, someone that you trust, someone you have complete confidence in, and they have a ferocious looking dog on a leash or on a chain as they answer the door for you to come into their home. And that dog's barking at you and it's foaming at the mouth and it wants to to get to you. You're probably going to hold back from entering into that house. But if you trust your friend, if you have true confidence in your friend and they say, don't worry, I've got him and he can't do anything that I won't allow. Again, if you trust that person, you will have complete confidence to enter their house, to go out to the backyard to do whatever you came to do. And I know that you see the analogy. God is on his throne. Satan is bound. So don't worry because he can't do anything that God will not allow. So go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, of all the ethne. This is the revelation of Jesus Christ of what he has done, of what began 2,000 years ago for us Gentiles and what continues until all the generations and the years are done. And then, this is what's important, not before, not chapter 17, 18, 19, before 20, but then after, as we'll come to in chapter 20, verses uh, 7 and following. Then, Satan will be loosed for a little while. But he's still only allowed to do what God allows him to do. And ultimately, it's all for his eternal judgment as well. And until then, taking all of Revelation into account, what are you to do? You're to overcome. You're to be led by the Spirit. You're to take the gospel to the world. That's the message of Revelation. That's the message even here in these first three verses. If we can hear them, the way they're truly conveyed in this book, Satan is already bound. God's judgment has begun. Satan is already defeated. And his spoils are already being divided up. So go out and gather. Or you are one who scatters. Amen. Let us pray.